Lord be. We'll strive for her might. So hail Harbor High. So, again, as we remember John's life, let's try and laugh a little bit today. I know there's going to be a lot of tears, there's a lot of tissues out there. This is a deeply sad moment for our school for a lot of different reasons. But again, I don't think he would want us to sit here and be upset for him. He left on his terms, his way, and thank God he did. The first person to come up here and speak today is Jane Daniel, his wife. Hi, everybody. Um, I know it says scripture reading, and I'm not going to talk for very long, but um, just wanted to just say hi and thank you all for being here. Thank you to Newport Harbor High School for doing this. This is um, amazing. Um, you know, he, <laughs> he loved this school so much. Um, he loved the kids so much. Um, if you're a student in here that um, either had him or, or um, you know, heard about him, I mean, he just, he absolutely, everything he did was for you guys. Um, and he, you know, as, as abrasive as he could sometimes be, I've heard maybe in staff meetings sometimes, <laughs> um, it was always, you know, coming from a place of, um, of just caring for those kids and wanting the best for them. And he, like I said, he loved this place, this, this you know, this was, this was his life. I mean, it, it really, I mean, we were too. But um, this, was, this was his life and, and his passion. So um, I just wanted to read um, a couple of um, his favorite scripture readings. Um, and it's from James, uh, the first chapter of James. The first one is um, verse 2 through 4. And um, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And then the next one is, um, it jumps to verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under, under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Thanks. Thank you, Jane. And now we have two student reflections, Emily Perez and Alden Burke from the class of 2016. Okay. I'm a little short, sorry. So first I just wanted to say how honored Alden and I are to be speaking here today on behalf of John Daniel's Fury 5 class last year. John Daniel or more commonly known as Daniels, to most of the students who were lucky enough to have him last year, was agreeably the best, one of the best teachers at Newport Harbor High School. Emily and I were two of the lucky ones who had the pleasure of being in his class last year. Both of us agree that Mr. Daniels' class was our favorite class because of the way he taught and how he made us want to learn. Not many teachers have the ability to connect with their students like Daniels did. For me, it was the hours of intense discussion about sports and, of course, our fantasy football lineups. For me, it was a sense of humor and teasing that really showed how he cared, um, whether it be about my outgoing personality, or as Daniels bluntly put it, Emily's big mouth. <laughs> I always knew that he truly did care. No matter da how Daniels felt in his personal life, he was always able to bring a cheerful and enthusiastic environment to the class. We could tell that others felt the same way, about, uh, same way we did about Daniels when we looked on social media and saw how many former students we're posting past memories they shared with Daniels. I would like to take this time to read you a few. On Facebook, a former student, Garrett Hall, posted, just now finding out Mr. John Daniel, a teacher at Newport Harbor, Newport Harbor High School, passed away. One of my all time, and I know a lot of others, favorite teacher. He cared about his students and made the day a lot more enjoyable. I pray for his family, but Mr. Daniel showed me that being a teacher is a lot more than just teaching out of a book and what it was to care about his students in and out of the classroom. What a great man. Another post from a student he had last year, David Schaefer, said, amazing guy, 
one of my favorite teachers as well, always so interested in educating students about what was really going on in the world, cared about his students and our country. Breaks my heart. Daniels always reminded us how much he loved us and how he knew the, f the feeling was mutual. We will miss passing by his room and seeing his friendly face. I know I, along many others, will remember Daniels for his, out, his outgoing personality. And his dancing eyebrows. An inside, joke, <laughs> an inside joke between our fifth period family. Thanks for all the great times and memories we cherish together. Daniels, you will be forever missed. Thank you. Thank you, Emily and Alden. And now we have faculty reflection from Mr. Dennis O'Hearn, who taught at Newport Harbor High School from 1966 to 1999, and Mr. John Chance, who also taught at Newport Harbor from 1984 to 2005. They were both social science department chairs. I don't think I'm going to be quite as hilarious as some of the other folks that are up here, but although John and I did have some good times together. I'd like to thank uh, the Daniel family for inviting me to speak for John tonight. Um, I first met John in 1980 when he was uh, a junior in, in Newport Harbor. Uh, I never had him in class, but I did take him back to the Discovering America tour, which I understand you're going to see a picture of him in, at some point in, in this presentation, I think. And we're all at the, uh, the Capitol building together. And at that time, you could really notice his passion for history. I mean, we took him to Mount Vernon, and we took him to Williamsburg and Gettysburg, and, and then he, he just came alive with the passion for history. He went to Washington, D.C., and he loved Washington, D.C. As New York City, Philadelphia, he came back just energized. And I didn't see him after that. He graduated in 1988. All of a sudden, he popped back up as a substitute for me. <laughs> And I was just amazed at how, having been around for a while at that time, he did everything I asked. Kids loved him. He was funny. In 1989, we had an opening. And I said, you know, I went to the principal and said, you have to hire this man. He has vitality. He has passion. He knows his stuff. I said, he's going to develop into one of the best teachers Harbor High has. And that certainly happened in the, in the next 25 years. Believe me, he was really fantastic. The kids loved him. Um, I would come back occasionally. I only taught with him for 10 years and I retired. But I would come back occasionally and he and I would speak together and talk about history and talk about this and that and his family. And, and uh, when he got married and we all went to his wedding, we had a great time at his wedding. Everybody was joyous. And he even changed then, he even became even a, a better teacher, a better person. Everything was fantastic. Anyway, that turned out to be one of the best decisions they ever made because I'll tell you, he was, he was really great. He loved to teach. He had passion. He had energy. He was passionate about everything he did, about his kids, and he had in class. He wanted every one of those kids he had in class to succeed. And if they didn't succeed, he was there to help them every inch, inch of the way to get through so they would. I admired his, his method of teaching. His conviction that he had all the way to the end of his life was fantastic. Um, he and I got in a few arguments here and there about grades and, and uh, volunteering and things of that nature, but he always respected others. All, every, everybody that he had, students, his, his colleagues, uh, he respected their, their ideas, even though he may very, they may have differed quite a bit from his. And he was a man of God, too. Um, I've been around now for a while, and uh, the last three or four years, I've seen a lot of my colleagues and a lot of uh, friends of mine pass away. And the way John dealt with his illness gave me a, really a deep, deep meaning of John, his faith, and how he handled everything. Um, I went up to visit him a few times. Um, some were brief, some were a little bit longer. And a couple of times he wasn't even home. He was at the doctor. I, I had missed him in my, in my passing. But um, um, he was just a fantastic individual. Good day. Uh, John was a colleague of mine. He was also a good friend. 
he's the guy that had cigarettes on campus, and um, uh, there were reasons occasionally that I needed one. But um, he also knew he also knew where you could smoke on a campus that you know you're not supposed to smoke on. Becky Coleman said it's a sad, sad day, and of course it is. Um, it's sad we we don't have uh, him to answer the questions that we'd like answered. Um, you could always count on him for an honest answer, and he was a good advisor for me. My wife Sue and I are watching the West Wing right now, the whole series. You can do that when you retire. Um, <laughs> It was one of John's favorites, and I would like to be able to ask him questions about that because politically we're a little bit different. But um, John's greatest strength as a teacher, several people have said already, was his dedication to uh, underachieving students, students who, who had to be convinced that this was fun, U.S. history and, and uh, government. In this auditorium, he, uh, he received uh, a couple of awards. Now, I've been gone for 10 years, so he probably earned some others too, but uh, one was the Bill Boyer Award, and that's significant because um, teachers, his fellow teachers, vote who gets that award, and, and he deserved it. And the second, I thought a uh, significant award he got is he had the yearbook dedicated to him one year. Um, and that, of course, is given by the students of Harbor. So the faculty and the students all appreciate him. He's a fellow teacher I will always remember. He loved government and US history, and he taught them very well. Our memories of John are good. When we, remember, when we remember John, it will always be a good day. Sometimes memories slip out of your eyes and roll down your cheeks. Thank you, Mr. O'Hearn and Mr. Chance. And now we will hear from alumni and the first alumni is a class of 1994 graduate, George Galdemez. Preparing this speech has been difficult, but it's also rewarding. It allowed me to reflect on the years that I attended Newport Harbor and the memories of the teachers that made a big impact in the four years that I attended here. John Daniels, or Mr. Daniels, was at the top of that list. I had the pleasure of meeting John Daniels, or Mr. Daniels, um, during Saturday school, which as we all know was trash pickup day. <laughs> he caught me actually at the vending machine and first thing he said is, since you're there, he's going to buy me a bag of um, sunflower seeds. I looked at him and chuckled. He chuckled back. He said, you have Saturday school next week. And I chuckled. And he said, meet me in my class after you're done. After uh, proceeding with what I needed to do is pick up trash, I went back and met in this class and we talked, and as we all know, he was very passionate about the Dodgers. At that time, I was passionate about the White Sox. So the debate ended up being a two-hour debate of whose team was better. <laughs> um, later that day, I went on as, as my day progressed, um, went about my day. Next morning, I went to church with my parents, and all I could talk about was about Mr. Daniels. Excuse me. I talked to my parents about Mr. Daniels because it was one of the first teachers that I had truly met that saw me more than just a student. In those two hours we spent, he allowed me to think that there was more to life than that present. There was a future ahead. The next following Monday, talked to my counselor, and I did everything possible to try to get in this class. Of course, I failed. <laughs> he said, strike one. <laughs> Second um, semester came around, tried again, 
went back and let him know he's at strike two. We met with base, for the baseball team with Mr. Beta, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Bates, I'm sorry, about the upcoming season. And he announced that Prinsado and Mr. Daniels were going to be the two coaches. I was so ecstatic. It was like a, like a puppy with a brand new toy. I had finally, I had finally gotten the chance to share a class with a guy that I looked up a ton. Sorry. I had a lot of respect in a, in a lot um, and just honored to be in his class, even if it was just baseball. He was not only a friend, he became my teacher, but he was also became someone that I looked up to on the years that I progressed with Newport Harbor. He influenced me to be a better and great leader for those that followed behind me. There are no words that I, that I can explain or express for such a great individual that Mr. Daniels was. Thank you for being a friend. Thank you for being a teacher. Thank you for being a mentor. May you rest in peace. Good afternoon. My name is Garrett Hall. I graduated in the class of 2014. I was not the best um, high school student. One of the rare uh, few A's I got was in Mr. Daniel's class. Now, was it because if the football team brought home a W, Mr. Daniel being the loyal supporter and teacher we all know he was, would give all the players A's? Of course. But I'm just messing, I'm messing around. Uh, no, it was something else. And I speak for a lot of the people when I say, Mr. Daniel was able to bring out the best of me in a, as a student, something every teacher dreams of, I would hope. I s never sat, I've never sat down and actually thought until now why that was. How did he do that? And the most accurate depiction of what made Mr. Daniel so successful at this was that he was real. And I use that term loosely because we live in a society today where it's so easy to compare happiness with one another. And if you're not as happy or happier than the person sitting next to you, then something's wrong with you. And I've always wondered why that is. In Mr. Daniel's class, you didn't have to pretend to be someone you weren't. You didn't have to pretend that everything was going your way. And you didn't have to be happy or pretend to be happy to hide your insecurities because when you stepped into that classroom, Mr. Daniel wasn't fake with you. He was transparent, and I cannot thank him enough for that. Mr. Daniel taught history, but I learned something a lot different than that in his class. Mr. Daniel taught his students that life isn't fair, nobody's entitled to anything, life isn't easy, life is supposed to be hard, the obstacles that we overcome help shape who we end up being, and that life sometimes just flat out sucks, and there's nothing that you can do about it, but that's not an excuse to not live your life to the best of your ability. And through that, Mr. Daniel taught me that with all this negativity that the world and life will throw my way, being a good person is the only answer. Being genuine, honest, and true to myself and others, just as he was and always is, is the not-so-secret ingredient to a truly happy and enriching life. Mr. Daniel's door was always open, and I think that paints a pretty good picture of who he was as a person. He was open, inviting, honest, and sometimes he didn't really need to say a word. You could just sit in his classroom and feel all right listening to whatever sounds would come out of his mouth during his 7 a.m. to 7.45 a.m. nap before school started. <laughs> <laughs> he picked up on the little things in people, their interests, their hobbies, their passions, and cared less for the little gra grammatical mistakes in the essays a student would turn in. The grade he would hand back to you after a big test did not affect the way he treated you pass or fail, because he cared about his students all the same. It made an impact if you couldn't already tell in today's room, and that's a special thing when you think about it. Teachers can have such an impact on students that they don't realize, especially in such a transitional time in a kid's life in high school. 
I woke up, I rushed to school. After I went to whatever sport was in season, grabbed a bite to eat with friends, and then went home, always, of course, sober, at 8.30 sharp to get a good night's rest. The time for family seems to dwindle and dwindle as the years go by. And in high school, and I don't mean to generalize, but students see their teachers almost as much as they see their parents. So why shouldn't they have just a positive impact? Mr. Daniel did. High school is hard for a lot, where the people you hang out with, the clothes you wear, the activities you partake in are all being judged under a microscope by everyone 24-7. And I think that's why so many students were drawn to Mr. Daniel, stayed late in his class, went in early to be in his presence, myself included. Because in a world of constant judgment, he didn't. And I think that speaks worlds to a man, to the man he was, because qualities like that nowadays are slim to none. I touched on Mr. Daniel picking up the little things in people, and I bet everybody here has their own little story or a personal moment of his overwhelming kindness and generosity, but I will quickly share mine. The email subject, congratulations. Garrett, I am so proud of you and the way you played last night. The same character you show me in the classroom came through on the field. You have been given a great gift that will take you very far, not just on the field, but in life. Congrats. Take care, Mr. D. It's hard for me to put into words how I felt after receiving an email like that, not from a friend, not from a coach, not from a parent, but from a teacher. I saved it and I'll keep it forever, but at the time, honestly, it meant the world to me. To Mr. Daniel, it was probably just another one of the kind deeds of being the guy that we all should want to be like. Did he do it to receive anything from me? I would think not, because the next time I saw him, I gave him a hug and said thank you, but I wish I would have said a lot more. November 11th, 2013, that's the date I received that email, nearly two years ago from the day. It's crazy how much can change in two years. Dreams, goals, ideas, people, they all change. Change is inevitable, and just like change, so is death. My heart hurts because I can't quite process why bad things happen to such great people like Mr. Daniel, but I think we can all find an answer in his teachings. That life isn't fair, life is not easy, and sometimes life really, really, really sucks. But that's no excuse to not live it to the fullest. And I know Mr. Daniel did. Not only was Mr. Daniel a teacher to me and my fellow classmates, but if we all look around, he is a role model to all of us. How being a man with the characteristics and qualities like him can touch so many lives and so many people, it's truly a beautiful thing. Socrates wrote, when the hour of departure has arrived and we go our ways, I to die and you to live, which is better? Only God knows. Mr. Daniel is in a better place, but I also know he's here today in this room smiling because he loves each and every one of us and fully believes we are destined to do great things. So let's not let him down. Let us honor a man who never asked to be honored. Let's talk about a man who never asked to be talked about. And let's celebrate a man's life who has never once been asked to be celebrated. Mr. John Daniel, a husband, a father, a brother, a history teacher, but a role model of so much more. Thank you. Thank you, George and Garrett. And now we have current faculty reflections by Dr. Harlow Nas and Mr. Dan Glenn, who taught on opposite sides of Mr. Daniel. Thank you all for coming. Um, it means a lot to the family, the faculty, the friends. Um, it shows how much John really meant to the um, Newport Harbor High community. Um, I knew John for about 25 years. Uh, it's, been a, it's amazing how fast that goes, as a lot of you know. Um, many, of the, many of those years, John and I were neighbors, like Sean was just talking about. I taught next to him. Uh, it was a pleasure. Um, when Sean asked me to speak in this area called Faculty Reflections, I started to reflect on those 25 years because I do what my boss asked, so I'm a good employee. Um, and a few things kind of sifted through those 25 years. 
Um, first of all, I remember John for his passion. His passion has been mentioned a number of times today. Um, you know, his, his ability to stand up at a faculty meeting and give his opinion, which he always had one. Um, I used to go to John to get coffee too. Um, it wasn't as strong as Bob Lear's coffee, and so I went over to uh, John Daniel's room when I needed to bum a, a cup of coffee. Um, so a lot of people talk about his passion, but few people were really privy to the venue where his passion really took flight, and that was the social studies department meetings. <laughs> Suffice it to say that many uh, meeting would end when John would stand up and say, okay, I'm leaving because if I don't leave now, I'm gonna say something I'm gonna regret. And that was John, you know, and we all just, okay, John, and we, we, we um, all became buddies after that. Um, The second thing that kind of filtered through all this, uh, in these 25 years, was his relationship with his students. You've heard some very incredibly nice, gifted words from the, the, the students who have come up here. Um, he, he worked well with almost all different types of kids. You know, and that's hard to say for all faculty. You know, it's, we have our little niches every now and then. We work with these kind of kids best. John dealt with all these kids very, very, very well. But there was one group, um, with whom he had a really good relationship. Those are the kids who are the, kind of the rebels. They are the kids who didn't fit that Newport Harbor High mold. Um, and some of these kids actually ended up going to um, our alternative ed because we couldn't meet their needs, and so we had to find a place where they could get their needs met. What, I remember one time I was talking to a colleague at a meeting, and they found out that I taught at Newport Harbor High, and uh, they said, oh, do you know John Daniel? This is a, a colleague that taught at one of the um, alternative ed. And, he, and I go, yeah, I know John. He goes. Well, whenever we have a kid who has been taught by John Daniel, they can't say enough good things about him. They just loved you know, John. And, what, what, and, and if they came to school, they came to school to see his class. And then the colleague continued and they said, well, and the kids usually don't say a whole lot more about any other faculty, you know, but they love John. You know, I said, well, thank you, that's, that's nice to hear. Um, I also started reflecting on having him next door to me for, it must have been 10, 15 years, something like that. And it was a mixed blessing, really. I mean, it was really nice to have a colleague next door who, with whom I could have a conversation with about, you know, pedagogy or, you know, curriculum stuff or the profession, or we talked about family, you know, raising kids. Um, we didn't talk about religion or government. That, that was, you know, a tough one for us. Um, but. <laughs> It was really nice to have him in that supportive, kind of nurturing, collegial um, environment. Um, so that was good. The bad thing was that when I walked by John's room on the way to my room, it filled me with a sense of guilt because John was a teacher who walked the walk. He did what he was supposed to do as a teacher. He did good teaching. You know? And I look and I'd walk in and go, oh my gosh, I should, should do that in my class and I wasn't doing that in my class, but he was doing what you're supposed to do, and he was a great teacher, and you've heard you know, the accolades over and over and over and over. Um, as a psychology teacher, I'm always thinking about, okay, what makes a person uh, who he or she is? You know, what made John, John? And so I was kind of thinking about this, and I was organizing a couple, some of John's things over the last couple days, you know, sifting through to find stuff that I could claim as my own, and, like I would expect, <laughs> like I'd expect him to do if the situation were reversed. Um, and I, saw, I found some interesting things. Um, every year or two, the faculty gets together and we um, vote for each other for different kind of awards, you know, and, and it's a, really a fun thing to do. Um, Missy Taravella and, and I always get our awards for our cars, not our teaching, you know, <laughs> whatever. And um, I, I found a couple of awards that John got from the faculty. Um, and this first one, it said, Newport Harbor High Teacher Appreciation, the award of most trustworthy, presented to John Daniel on this 19th day of May 2001, presented by the teachers of Newport Harbor High. Then I dug a little deeper and I found this one. It said, Newport Harbor High School, the award of Campus Rebel, presented to John Daniel on this 26th day of April 2012. An interesting combination of traits. <laughs> trustworthy and rebel. A trustworthy rebel. That's really what John was. And um, he's going to be greatly missed in our department. Thank you very much. Um, I had the pleasure of being on the other side of um, Mr. Daniel from um, Dr. Nas. And, uh, for quite a few years. I also had the honor of, um, we got to teach 
each other's students each year because I taught economics and he taught American democracy. And then at the semester we would switch. And one of my favorite things to do would be if a student had a question dealing with a caucus or um, electoral college or anything else, it would be, I just love, I'll, I'll just go down and talk to Mr. Daniel. And I'd walk down in the middle of his lecture, his eyes would light up and he would just go off on a little answer to my question and I'd come back and I'd say, you guys are gonna be so lucky next semester because that's the teacher that you get. Um, we had a mutual respect for each other and um, we used to kid around because he was not a big fan of um, economics and I wasn't a huge fan of American democracy, but we, uh, <laughs> we, we loved teaching what we taught. Um, a student came by um, a little while ago that had both of us and her name's Natalie Ward. Um, she's at the University of Notre Dame and she said, I, I've heard a little bit about Mr. Daniel and um, could you please give this to him? And I was never able to give it to him, but it is uh, fitting, and I'm gonna put it right next to the coffee pot because it's a, it's a mug, and it's the University of Notre Dame. Um, she's currently there right now and, and doing very well. Um, and uh, when I was thinking about all this that happened and I had the honor to speak on this, I thought of a, a, an essay that I'd heard. I've, I read a lot of coaching books, and this is a book by Lou Holtz. And it talked about a former Notre Dame football player, and it's called The Dash. Um, it says, I've seen death stare at me with my own eyes in a way many cannot know. I've seen death take others, but still leave here below. I've heard many screams of mother's cries, but death has refused to hear. In my life, I have seen many faces with many, many tears. After death has come and gone, a tombstone sits for many to see, but it serves no one than a symbol of a person's memory. Under the person's name, it reads the date of birth and the date the person passed. But the more I think about the tombstone, the only important thing is the dash. Yes, I see the name of the person, but that I might forget. I also read the date of birth and death but that I might not even stick. But thinking about the person, I can't help but remember the dash because it represents a person's life and that will always last. So when you begin to chart your life, make sure you are on a positive path because people may forget your birth and death, but they will never forget your dash. Mr. Daniel's dash has had a, and will continue to have a tremendous impact on Newport Harbor High School. For Mr. Daniel possessed the gift of teaching. He had a love of learning and teaching that so many people admired so much. His passion transcended onto his students and he had the magical ability to get the unmotivated student to want to complete assignments and learn because they did not want to disappoint him. After doing this, the students realized how important and interesting history and American democracy are. That is the gift that Mr. Daniel gave Newport Harbor. I spent so many mornings talking to Mr. Daniel about ways to motivate and stimulate the unmotivated. It would absolutely crush his heart when he felt a student did not care. He would continue to try every teaching method to try to light a fire and spark a love of learning. I have witnessed so many of his students, both past and present, that were touched by his passion and developed a love for learning. Not only did Mr. Daniel have an impact on the students, but also the faculty of Newport Harbor High School. Longtime Newport Harbor basketball coach Larry Hurst could not wait to talk to me at break on Wednesdays to find out what happened in our social science department meetings. <laughs> Some people would call what happened in those meetings arguments, but I always thought of them as healthy discussions. Mr. Daniel would usually have a different opinion than many others in the room, but his voice was always heard and respected. We are all very blessed to have been touched by a person that had such a positive influence on so many people and made a difference. When I think of the words teacher and passion, I think of Mr. Daniel. His dash will live forever at Newport Harbor High School. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weed. And now we will hear from a classmate of John, Mr. Gary Teagle.
Thank you all. Uh, I'm glad he didn't do Amazing Grace because I would have lost it. <laughs> uh, I'm Gary Teagle and uh, classmate and friend of John. I met John Daniel, or JD as I called him, uh, freshman year of high school for the better part of four years. Uh, started the day with JD, weightlifting, and ended the day at baseball practice. Because back then, we did baseball all year long. Um, through our high school days, we had a common bond, and that was baseball and humor. And uh, we both absolutely loved baseball. We were on horrible teams <laughs> during our time in high school. We were lucky to squeak out a win or two each season. But whether at practice or a game, there was JD. He was always the encourager. JD was the guy, when we were down and it was our turn to bat, he'd be the first one to fire up the bench. Come on, guys, we're only down by 12. <laughs> when it was our turn in the field, he was the one talking it up and chatter and motivating not only the pitcher, but everyone. He was the original Energizer Bunny. One note, he was really short. <laughs> he was like a foot or two shorter than everybody. And uh, I, I don't know, but I wish I had a picture of that baseball glove, because his first baseman's mitt, honestly, was like half his size. <laughs> but you know what? I think that if the coach could have put JD's fight, spirit, and enthusiasm in every player, we couldn't have lost. When they asked if I could speak, speak about high school days, I was a bit hesitant because most of the stories I could not tell in this forum. <laughs> but suffice it to say, we were active boys and liked to have fun. And we probably would have been an alternative high school if we got caught at half the things we did. <laughs> I will tell one story as JD was an individual full of school spirit. One time, J.D. and the Gallardo brothers in the purple El Matador van, for anybody who uh, knows the restaurant, the, the brothers Caesar and Marcel got kicked out of Estancia and had to go to Harbor High. So any time that the El Matador rolled up and said, hey, you want to go with us, I usually said, no way. <laughs> Anyways, they went over to uh, Edison High School and uh, wrote NH rules all over the dugouts. And somehow they got caught. Imagine that, a purple van on the infield grass <laughs> painting NH rules. So uh, they had to paint their dugouts and then come back and do ours also. And uh, uh, Mr. Jacobson definitely knew who the Daniel boys were. Uh, but, you know, he made it a practice to tell stories in his class of the mistakes he made and to ensure his, his students didn't didn't do any of the shenanigans that we pulled off. Um, after high school, we parted ways, John going down to San Diego State, and I headed off to the Navy. My first assignment was on a ship down in San Diego, and early on, I didn't have a car, so I used to take the train on occasion uh, to come home on the weekends. And lo and behold, there's John taking the train back on Sunday evenings. You know, so we would hook up, and, and man, that two-hour train went really fast. Because John would tell his adventures of college, and I'd tell my Navy stories, and, and we just have a good time. But we'd get down to the train station down in San Diego, and he'd always have his bros out there with the car, usually a beat-up, like, uh, uh, VW bus. And John would always talk these guys into taking me back to the base, which was in the opposite direction of the direction they need to go. So it's late. These guys are like, no, have them take the train or whatever. But John, you know, he would force them. Hey, no, we're going to do this. Because that's the kind of guy he was. He was always taking care of people, always helping people out. When I learned he was a teacher at our old alma mater, I visited him, and we would see each other on occasion. When I started hearing us about his popularity as a teacher and my kids became of age, I introduced all three of them to JD at back to school night and said, if you ever have any problems, go to Mr. Daniel. He will help you out because I'm sure he's been there and done that. My daughter, the only smart one in the group, <laughs> had him as a teacher. 
And uh, she had the privilege of having it. I called her last week and I told her, and she was very sad. She lives in North Dakota. But I said, hey, can you give me one sentence that you would want, say to describe Ms. Mr. Daniel? Fiery, energized, really passionate about his job. And as a student, he made it interesting to the point you wanted to go to class and see what was next. Now, that should be a goal of all teachers, I think. Most recently, I was reading and keeping up on his blog about changes and reform in the school system. He was an excellent writer and had great insight on the subject. He had written, we had written back and forth like three weeks ago, and I had no idea he was ill. But that's the kind of guy he was. We were back and forth, and he's like, hey, how's your family? How's everything going? He never said, hey, you know, I'm sick. I don't want to deal with this. But we talked back and forth. He was a visionary, and he was always seeking to make the system better. It was never about him, but always about the kids. Uh, a few key things that JD would say to the kids in class, it's not about politics. It's not about being a Republican or a Democrat. It's about being a productive member of society, working hard, and when you see something that needs to be fixed, fix it, or be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Stand in the gap and be the difference. One of the last items I read that he wrote in his journal, and I was hoping it wasn't what the other member was talking about, because I was like, there goes, there goes my talk. But he said, uh, which was very inspiring. I mean, his journal on that blog was amazing. I actually print it out and pass it out because it's such an encouragement. And I hope and pray someday that I have that kind of strength at the end. Uh, he said, I've been blessed for the first time in understanding what it means every day is a good day. I always base my days, whether good or bad, with being getting my way, being a good day, or bad, not getting my way. <laughs> now I embrace each day with a sense of gratitude, which is a huge change for me. The biggest example, though, is when I figured out each day is good because either I contributed to others or I learned from my mistakes. God's graced me with his wisdom of experiencing every day as a good day regardless of the circumstances. And for a guy who sees the glass as half empty, I'm now getting to see life as half full. And what a difference there is between the two. I hope his wife and son and family know what an impact he had and will have on generations that got to sit in his classroom. Along with the countless folks, he gave a hand over his life here on earth, including myself. He lives his last days with faith and trust in the Lord. JD knew his ultimate destination was to be with God in heaven. And I'm certain when he got there, God said, good, well done, oh good and faithful servant. Thank you and God bless you all. Thank you, Gary. And now we have another current faculty member to present the family, Jane and Jacob, a gift. Bob Lear. Um, I don't think I need a microphone. <laughs> I never have in my life. Okay. So why start now? Um, during faculty meetings, John and I would sit in those two seats over there in the corner. And I was lucky enough, <clears throat> honored, to when John came down to sick last June, I saw him, if not once a week, twice a week, until he passed. And he told me a story that a fellow faculty member, Jim Sigafus, who taught English, that the staff would always crack up because John and I were sitting in those two corner, those two seats over there. Everybody else 
Sean was always over here, and so most of the faculty was over here, and we were over there. And he said, you know, you guys remind me of the curmudgeons in, in the Muppets. <laughs> Because we would sit back there, we go, and I go, this is, there were usually some explicit news on my part. Um, what are you coming for, John? And, and, we, and we, we'd start going back and forth. And, um, you know, we go, well, why don't they listen to us? I mean, we have all the answers, right? Um, anyway. From, From that, I would like, like to... to, to Thank you, pardon. pardon. Um, I don't want to talk, talk to you. I don't want to talk, talk to you. Jake. This is not going to You've heard some things about your dad, and they're all true. But I want you to understand why they are true. There is a First and foremost, that your dad and I agreed on. Your dad and I saw life in through the same lens, through how we could go about it, trying to live our lives and to make it. From Proverbs 27, verse 6 Wound to a friend can be trusted. But an enemy, an enemy multiplies biases. And what that means, my friend, is your dad is a friend to everybody. Because he had a pure heart. He spoke from here. A lot of people couldn't take that. But every time he disagreed with anybody, it was a pure heart. And he wanted to try to make things better. And you need to know that. Okay. I didn't know that John played baseball until the staff meeting that Mr. Mulder found a picture of John just after he got changed for some something. So I thought it was fitting. Coach Chalmers now the baseball coach. Coach and I went out to the field. This is the right field marker. 225 yards. yards. Um, because you love baseball. baseball. Okay. And I, well, no, that wasn't, that wasn't enough. enough. And I know I this may not look like much, Jacob, but this is yours. Okay. The sides of this are from the dugout. Benches in the dugout. Okay. Um, it's a box I thought that uh, you could have just to throw stuff into, do whatever. But I also want you to know that the staff has um, sent emails like crazy. I've saved them and I've printed them all out. But it's for time for you, 10 years down the road, whatever. These were your dad's dad. And the memories um, that the staff has uh, you've heard, heard, you know, from, from students <coughs> and other people what a great name he was. Coach Glenn was so kind in making these t-shirts that we want you to have one. Okay. And all the, there were some pictures in here that I the name played over his door, okay, in all the emails, okay. And these are things that, you know, I want you to have, I want you to look at the box and go, you know, maybe Dad sat on that bench, <laughs> okay, all right. So, I know it's not much, um, but it was made a lot of love. And uh, I just, I just, I want you to know that your dad, I gave you the whole in my heart, my heart. But I know that you know it is better, better. Okay. And I want to finish. Finish. That's okay. Two seconds. Yeah.
versus chapter four or two six seven. Because I was going around trying to figure out okay, I'm going to say I wanted to talk to you specifically. Second Timothy chapter four, verses six and seven. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come to my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept my head. John had on finished strong, kept the faith. And he had a home run. Love you. Love you. And now Buddy Daniel, class of 1979, and Jacob Daniel are coming up here for a family reflection. Hi, how are you guys tonight? We get Jacob wants to speak last. We're going to let him speak last. And this is Jacob, Johnny's son, and he's going to be with you in just a second. I'm John's brother, older brother. Uh, yeah. Just want to thank, thank you all for the kind words. You know, me and Johnny have fought a lot. We, we've loved a lot. Uh, but to hear the man John became, it's broke my heart. That wasn't a bigger part of it. But I want to tell you who Johnny was to me. Johnny was passionate. I had never met anybody with more passion in my entire life. Uh, when he was a kid, he wanted to play sports so bad. And as Gary said, he didn't quite grow until he got to college. In fact, <laughs> true story, no, really, he was a little shorter than Jacob. <laughs> That's my imagination. But uh, uh, he went away to college. When he came back, I didn't recognize him. Uh, he was my height. <laughs> and it's like, wow, how'd that happen? I mean, I literally walked right by him. Johnny, but he wanted to play sports. Baseball, so bad. He wanted to play football. He wanted to be a pro basketball player, basketball. It didn't matter. He just wanted to be a pro something. And like Gary said, he worked hard at it. At home at night, he'd throw a ball against the garage all night long, learning how to scoop up bad throws from Gary's teammates because they were pretty pathetic. Okay. <laughs> uh, he learned to uh, throw footballs. He, he, he basketball, he'd shoot hoops. He'd go out and play the Monta Vista school and go shoot hoops with our dog and just shoot all night long until it got dark or my mom, Sharon, would yell at us to get home. He had a passion to play sports, and Gary said he didn't quite grow until he got to college, and it dawned on John he probably wasn't going to be a pro athlete. And as one of the students said, John became a fantasy football owner. Many, many, many teams. That's what we did the last year and a half together, me and John, a lot of fantasy football teams. We were undefeated until last week, <laughs> the team we had together. I think he took my players with him. So... Uh, <laughs> Uh, like I said, he, he, as a teacher, he would tell me stories, and he would, would tell me about the faculty meetings, <laughs> and I'm glad you guys remember the same way, same way he tells them to me. He, uh, <laughs> when he first got sick, he said, but I want you to go there, I want you to tell them this and this and this, because they don't listen to me. <laughs> And I, never, I don't have a problem making a fool of myself. I've been asked to leave here once, and they can do it again. <laughs> but, but the support and the love that he saw in the, in the last year, the last eight months, changed his heart so much. Uh, it, it, it truly changed his attitude. He, I, it was the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen. You know, he did fall in love with every one of the, the faculty and the, the, the students. Uh, man, the passion for the students he'd come home and every summer I'd hear the same thing. I can't keep doing it because there's always that one student that wouldn't listen to him. There's that one student he couldn't reach. I can't do this because that one student would break his heart every year. I, I, I just can't teach again. I can't do it because, like I said, there'd be that one student. And then every year he'd come back because he knew he could reach that one more student. And he did it every year. And it was the last five years that John's changed his attitude a little bit. And I'll kind of get to that in a little while. But he found great joy in teaching every student. And, and he did his best. And, and it's funny, I'd be at a restaurant and, hey, do you know, are you, they find out I'm Bud Daniel. Do you know Mr. Daniel? I said, yeah, he's my brother. That's the greatest teacher I've ever had. And I said, seriously? <laughs> 
I know him. <laughs> no, John, you know what? As kids, we fought. I mean, like I said, there's one story. I'll tell a really quick story. I wasn't going to tell any stories, but I got to tell one. I was a sophomore here at Newport, and one of the classes decided I made teacher's assistant, had some teacher assistant ability, so they sent me over to Kaiser to go teach, to help, teach, help one of the teachers over there at Kaiser. Johnny happened to be in my class. So I don't know what the argument was over. It was something stupid. But he threw a paper at me, and I threw a pencil at him, and he threw a book at me, and I threw a trash can at him, and he threw a, <laughs> <laughs> he threw a table at me, and it ended when he stabbed me, and I still got the lead mark here in my arm. <laughs> Principal calls my mom, and she says, you got to get to school. Your son's been fighting. She goes, which one? He says, both of them. <laughs> they're, fight they're fighting each other. The teachers emptied the room, and we need your help to get them in under, in under order here. So, yeah, we, we had lots of those fights. We had one on this campus, you know. We had many on this campus. But, man, I love Johnny. I miss Johnny. I know Johnny came from a, as a child, Johnny came from a split family. You know, we had many moms and dads growing up, and Johnny had such a passion, just like he did for uh, teaching. He wanted to make every one of them proud of him. Everything he did was to make his parents proud of him, all of them. I took the easy route. Johnny took the hard route. He wanted to make every one of his parents proud of everything that he did. He had such a great desire to show his parents that that they're doing a good job. And it was never for him, it was for them to know that he appreciated everything they did for him. You know, he loved his wife and his son. And that story is really theirs to tell, and I'm not going to tell that one. But he loved his wife and his son. The one thing I will tell you is the only time I saw John sh shed a tear was uh, when we talked about Jacob. Because Jacob is a very special young man. And God has anointed him to do some wonderful things, and John knew it. We just don't know what it is yet, and we'll find that one day later. But John wanted to be here to see it, so he shed a tear because he wasn't going to be here to see it. But he understands that he will see it, and he'll have a better view of it than we will. He'll have a better understanding of it than we will. John became my best friend. He went from my worst enemy. <laughs> True. We, you know, we, we, we competed again on everything. I mean everything. I mean, I won because I was taller, but <laughs> and I could beat him up. But <laughs> he was always smarter than I was. There was no, no question about that. I knew that from an early age, you know, but he always had a really bad temper, and I just had to call him a short little fat fart. And then he would lose his temper, and I would win the argument because he'd lose his temper, and I knew that. And we, growing up, even as we got older, as we had our families, we started talking a little bit, and we started talking a little bit more. And uh, uh, one day out of the blue, Johnny gave me a call. And I was teaching at a, a church doing a, a fourth, fifth, and sixth grade kids. Yeah, I became a teacher, believe it or not, church. <laughs> uh, but he called me up. He goes, he's going through some paperwork, and he's trying to find and figure out some things. He's trying to figure out who God was. And he's reading this one verse, and it happened to be the verse that I was teaching on that day. And it was just such an, an, an amazing God moment at that time. We started calling each other every Wednesday before I go teach this class, and we started talking more and more and more, and we got closer and got closer. And, 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 and as, a, as the years went on, like I said, I love my brother, and I've never been able to say that. And I'm going to miss him. You know what? Towards the end, I thought I was there to support him. You know, I got the humor. I get to make fun. And we never talked about the cancer. We just didn't. We talked about life. We talked about the teachers. We talked about the faculty. We talked about the students. We talked about baseball, football, our fantasy teams. And, uh, uh, and I thought I was there to, just to help encourage him. And a long time ago, I learned to protect myself. I never allowed people into my life. I like everybody, and I have fun with everybody, but I never allowed anybody in because I didn't want to be hurt anymore. And Johnny got in. I've never wept more for anybody in my life. I'm going to miss him. But I know where he's at. And I rejoice in that. You know, so many of us want to talk about the cancer and the ugliness of this disease. And it is ugly. But I want to help you guys understand the real story. The story John wanted you to know. John understood the truth. John understood 
that death was conquered with the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And John lived that way, with that understanding. The journal entries that you heard was because he had great faith in that promise that Jesus gave us. Cancer gave John something that he'd been looking for his whole life. John was always searching for peace and joy and happiness. He always struggled with that. And it's like some of the students, some of the teachers said, John's cup was always half empty. <laughs> it's always missing something. But towards the end, John found a, a real peace. He found a great ability to love others. He found a thankful heart in everything. And that included all of the students and the teachers that are here today, his friends. He was so thankful. Uh, when, we got, when we first had a surgery, when we started getting the letters, John just, just broke down weeping. He goes, I never knew. I never knew that people appreciated me this much. I never knew. And that started the change of his attitude. John called me one day. He learned joy. John's really never been a real joyful person. I mean, he likes his Dodgers and he likes that stuff, but he, it's only a momentary. He never really experienced joy in, in a full day. And I was at work. I built homes for a living, and then I'm on the street, and John gives me a call in the morning. He goes, did you see the sunrise this morning? And I said, yeah, John, I did. He goes, no, no, did you see the sunrise this morning? I said, yeah, John, I see it every morning. I go to work at 5 o'clock. I'm here. I see it. He goes, no, 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 did you see the colors? I finally saw a sunrise. He found the ability to really love people. John loved the students. There was no doubt about that. But John some people would irritate John, and I'm sure a lot of you know that. <laughs> but John learned to love everybody unconditionally. We would have arguments on it. John would say towards the end, he goes, who am I of all people to judge anybody? He would unconditionally love everybody. It was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. You know, in the last 10 months, I watched my father and my brother be called home to the Lord. And, uh, but they both said the same thing in those last couple of months of the, on this side of eternity. They both said the same thing. I wish I could have loved, helped, or served others more for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Something about death brings out the truth. And the truth is, and the truth that John wanted you to know is that everyone here is loved. Everyone in this room, everyone that sees us on YouTube, is loved by our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And he wanted you all to understand that truth. Because that's where the truth is found. It's not found in, in the, the fantasy football, the coffee cups, or whatever the things are. Those are wonderful moments. But the truth is found in our Lord Jesus. And I'm going to sum this up probably with a young man who has a better understanding of this truth than anybody in this room. That's the young man next to me. Johnny found out he had cancer. First he found out he had a tumor in his lung, and then he found out he had tumors in his head, his brain. Called me up and said, well, I got the 10-7 split. He goes, I need you to help me. He says, what I want to find is this. I, I want to I really experience the peace and joy that the scriptures talk about. I really want to understand that, and I want to finish strong. He gets home after that conversation with me, and he sits Jacob down, and he sits down with, I may have the words messed up a little bit, but the story itself is pretty true. He says, Jacob, this is what's going on, because Johnny has always told Jacob the truth about everything. He's never misled, didn't try to hide anything from Jacob. He, he, try, he treats Jacob just like he treats you students. Like you're real, that you're important, and you guys were important to him, so please understand that. He loved you guys so much, but he loved his son, and he talked to his son just like he talked to you. And he said, son, this is what's going on. He says, the doctors give me two months to two years to live. And Jacob didn't say anything for a second. John says, Jacob, you know, do you have anything you want to say? Jacob paused for a second, then he says, well, Dad, this is the way I see it. Jesus can heal you, and he'll be glorified. He says, but Jesus can take you home, and he'll still be glorified. He says, Dad, we can't lose. Jesus is going to be glorified. 
and that's the young man that's standing before you who's going to talk after me. That's Johnny's last wish for all of you to understand is to finish strong, but to find that one truth. So if you have questions, ask anybody that, that, that will be willing to talk to you about that. But that's Johnny's true wish for all you guys, to understand that peace and joy that he found at the end of his life. So with that being said, hopefully this thing comes off. I don't think, are you talking to this, Jacob? I'm going to let Jacob take over. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming here. And of course, all you know, my dad was a really great man. He was great at everything, being, being a husband, being, being my dad, being a teacher. He was just great at everything. And looking here, I can see how much, he, how much everyone loved him. And I try to be the best I can to be him, but there's some things I can't be like him. Like, for example, I don't think ever in my life I can drink that much coffee. <laughs> <laughs> but still, I try to be the best I can. And he taught me many life lessons and taught, and taught me just many good things in general, how to, some nice hobbies to do, good, really nice things, maybe into good things. He was just, he was just great. And also, after, after what happened and, and what happened before, he, everyone asking me, are you okay, is there anything I need to do? And honestly, I'm fine. Honestly, the only thing you should do is just praise God that no matter what, that's, that will be fine, either if he lives or is in heaven, which right now he is, and heaven is a much better place in here. And he, I'm just really glad that he's up there and in a much better world. But still, we, but still, down here, we're able to learn from him and, at, and just really understand how, what he did to us and how we're able, and just to, he was so good. We would like to thank everyone that made today possible and thank you for putting together this wonderful event in such short notice. But the most important message here is the fact that we lost an incredible educator, an incredible friend, a colleague that will always leave a void with us, but will fill our hearts with his memories. And also his message of the last faculty uh, email that he sent out about remaining present, loving who you're with, and then living life with a passion that's enduring. And with that, Jane, Jacob, and Buddy, and the rest of the Daniel family, just know that here at Newport Harbor High School, you'll always have a family, you'll always have friends, and you'll always have the support that you need throughout the years. So please, visit us as much as possible, check in once in a while, and John's memory here at Newport Harbor High School will be everlasting. Thank you. At, uh, in the inner quad here, we're going to have refreshments and there'll be some time for us to decompress after this. But again, thank you for everyone for showing up today, for remembering this incredible man. <laughs>